Hi, hello, how are you? Craig Chapman here for Embarcadero Technologies, and today we're going to be looking at building REST based applications using RAD Server and RAD Studio. My email address and Twitter handle are on the screen, so feel free to get in touch if you have questions. Let's take a look at what we'll be discussing today. First up, I'm going to introduce REST, what REST is and why you should consider using REST to design your applications. And then I'll discuss some of the common practices in building REST applications that have become something of a de facto standard. We'll then open up the IDE and begin building a REST service with RAD Server. And we'll follow that by building an application to consume that service. So let's get started. What is REST? The word REST is an abbreviation of the phrase representational state transfer. It's an architectural design style introduced in a 2000 dissertation by Roy Fielding. Roy is the co-founder of the Apache HTTP server project and was responsible for designing the HTTP protocol version 1.1. In fact, the HTTP protocol was designed using REST as the design style. Now, REST is not a standard or a protocol. It's a, a style for architecting an application. And in that way, it's somewhat loose. But Roy's dissertation discusses several constraints which should be applied to your application design in order for it to be considered RESTful. So today, in the interest of brevity, we're going to discuss four of these constraints and how they apply to your applications. Again, for brevity, the first two constraints I'm going to group into one. In order to be RESTful, an application should be a client-server based application and services should be layered. This essentially means that REST is a SOA based architectural style, so a service oriented architecture style, in which the client portion of the application consumes one or more services, which may be grouped by functionality into layers. In the demonstration today, we'll build just one service, so we'll have just one layer. Our next constraint is that communication between the client and the server should be stateless. This, of course, does not mean that your application has no state, but rather the server should not be responsible for the state of the client. For example, if the client part of your application is reading data from the server in pages, the server is not responsible for remembering which page of data the client just read and which one it needs to read next. The client maintains its own state in that regard. In a REST application, the server is considered to be a state machine in which the data itself is the state. So the client application can alter the state of the server by transferring state changes to it in the form of new data representations, hence the name representational state transfer. We'll discuss this in a little bit more detail later. The final constraint that we'll consider today is that a RESTful application should have a uniform interface. This is often the difficult part for someone new to REST to understand, particularly for engineers familiar with object-oriented programming. Typically, in other client-server-based architectures, resources on the server are considered to be objects, with methods and remote procedure calls to be made to manipulate those objects. For example, in a library application, you might call one method named getBooks to retrieve a list of books that are available for loan. And then you'd call another method getMembers to retrieve a list of library members that can borrow those books. In a REST application, objects on the server are called resources and they're considered to be representations of state, so part of the state of the server. A select few methods are used to manipulate these resources through state changes. So if you consider the well-known CRUD, in which you have only four methods, create, read, update, and delete. These four methods are reused across all types of objects. So you can create books, read books, update books, delete books. And similarly, you can create, read, update, and delete members. And this works for any other kind of object. This is reflected in the way that HTTP functions with its six methods, get, post, put, delete, options, and head. And we'll see this again as we look at some of the more common practices in REST applications. For now, let's take a minute to talk about why you might want to use REST for the architectural style of your own application. As we've discussed already, REST imposes a uniform interface on communication between the components of your application. This means that it's possible to split up the development of an application among several developers or teams. REST is also ubiquitous. Many major organizations are using REST to provide online APIs and data resources. Most programming languages and development environments have strong support for REST-based applications already. REST application resources are also discoverable, so that any client that conforms to the application interface needs little more than a single resource locator, a single URL, to discover the available data and services on a particular server. 
Due to the stateless nature of REST applications, they are also resilient to unstable connectivity situations, such as running an application on a cell phone or a tablet where network connectivity may not be consistent. And REST applications scale. If you need proof of this, just look at the entire World Wide Web. It's basically one giant REST application. Scalability doesn't get much better than that. So as I mentioned earlier, REST is not a standard or a protocol. Having chosen to use REST for your application, how can you be sure that the data and services of your APIs can be consumed by third-party applications? Just what are the common practices and standards used in most REST applications? Well, while these are not requirements imposed by REST, there are several common practices used when building REST-based applications. First of all, REST applications typically use HTTP as their transport protocol. Being RESTful itself, HTTP lends itself to building REST services. So common is this practice that the term web service is now almost synonymous with REST service. Using HTTP also means that your REST services can make use of uniform resource locators or URLs. Often a piece of data is identified on a REST server by a URL with an item name or number appended. The HTTP methods post, get, put, and delete are typically translated as create, read, update, and delete respectively, which offers the uniform interface that's required as part of a REST application as the well-understood CRUD pattern. In order to transfer data to and from a REST service, JSON is typically used as the transfer encoding. JSON being born out of JavaScript is a human readable data encoding. It makes it easier to work with for debugging purposes and it's understood by just about every web browser. For this reason, most programming languages also have facilities for encoding and decoding the JSON format. So this makes JSON a great candidate for transferring data objects or representations between the client and server application. So with this understanding, let's get started and build a REST service. Okay, so here I am in the RAD Studio IDE and I have my RAD server installed and configured and we're ready to start looking at how to build SOAP services using RAD Studio. Now, I have this pre-made source code package here which you'll be able to download from either the link in the video description or the accompanying blog post and it contains both Delphi and C++ Builder source code for both the server and the client component that we're going to take a look at. Before we do get started looking at the source code, however, I'm going to show you how to build the server-side package for RAD Server. Now, before I do that, I'd like to clarify a little bit more terminology. So, as far as RAD Server is concerned, a resource is actually a collection. So, I'm going to be looking at the employees database that comes with Interbase as part of the RAD Studio install, and it contains a table called employees. Now, that whole table, of course, is a collection of records, collection of employee records. And so we're going to expose that as a resource called employees. That's a collection. If we wanted to look at a individual employee record, we can specify it by adding the record ID on the end of the URL. When we do this, we're referring to a specific item within that resource. And then finally, we've got the endpoint, get, post, put, and delete, the HTTP methods. These are essentially called endpoints in RAD server. Now, the reason I point this out is that other programming languages and other tools do things differently. So you may find documentation online which differs from this terminology, but this is the way that it's done in RAD server. So let's get started by creating a new project. Okay, so I'm gonna go File, New, Other, and because we're building for C++ Builder, we'll select C++ Builder Projects, RAD server, and then I'm gonna select a RAD server EMS package. And that's gonna open up the EMS wizard. Now the first page of the wizard asks, do I want to create an empty package that I can add resources to later, or do I want a package with an existing resource already in it? Now if I choose the second option, the IDE is gonna do a little of the work for me and build a template resource. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. Now the resource name, as I said, this is the collection name, this would be employees. And then I need to select, do I want a data module or a unit? Well, if I select a data module, I'll be able to drag and drop um, FireDAC controls, FireDAC components onto a visible design layout, which is the data module. If I select a unit, then I have to instance those classes in the code at runtime. I'd like to do this at design time, so I'm gonna leave that as a data module. Now at this point, I could click finish and I would be done. 
Uh, however, it would only put in two of the HTTP methods. So let's go and take a look by clicking next at what we can select here. We can have the get method, the post method, the put method, and the delete method. Now you'll notice that get is actually there in two forms. The first is to get the entire collection, and the second is get item, to get a single item from the collection. Similarly, the put method is only available as a put item. In other words, we're only going to be able to update one item at a time in this call. And the reason is that this is using the URL again to specify the item number. So we get a single method to update the specified item. And the same is true for the delete method. We are going to specify on the URL which item we'd like to delete. So that's the methods that we can select. I'm going to make sure they're all selected and click on finish. So let's take a look at the project that's been created. And essentially what we have here is a data module that we can put our data components onto. And if we look at the code behind, we're going to see our get, get item, post, put item, and delete methods in here. So those are our HTTP methods. Now the item here is going to be appended to the URL. So if we have, for example, forward slash employees, forward slash five, that's going to give us the number five when we request the item parameter. So we've got that little bit of code already pushed in for us as uh, an example, but let's go ahead and put a little bit more code in here. So in the response, a response, I'm going to set the body of the response, set value, and then I'm going to pass in a JSON string that I'm going to create. So T JSON string, T JSON string, and this will be new, and then we need to give the string a value, and I'm just gonna pass in employees, and that's what we'll get back from this method. Now, I'm gonna take a copy of that code and paste it in down here, but I'm going to append to the string int to stru of item. Okay, and let's put a space in there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and save this project off and run it. Oh, and I forgot a parameter. Okay, so I need to put in comma true in each of these. Now, what this is doing is I'm creating a new JSON string here and setting this property to true says that this string will now be owned by a response. And that means that a response will be responsible for freeing the string. And the reason that we want to do that is this JSON string is a class and the response depends on it, but the actual response to the get method isn't sent until this method ends. So if we dispose of the string before we get to the end of this method, then a response may not be able to send its response because it depends on that string. So uh, we set true to say that a response owns this class and it'll take care of freeing it for us. Okay, let's see if this will run. What did I do wrong? Ah, okay, I don't need to int a str because it's already a string. Okay. And there we go, so we're running. So this is the EMS server, which is effectively the development server. So we are building a package here which will be installed into either Microsoft's IIS server or into an Apache server but we might not have Microsoft IIS or Apache installed on our local development system. And so the EMS development server takes the place of that web server. It's already loaded our package for us and our package is running. So let's go ahead and open the browser. Now by default, we're gonna be brought to this version resource, which is gonna tell us the version string for the EMS server. And there are a handful of other resources that are built in out of the box, but what we're interested in right now is the employees resource. So when I click on employees, we get the string employees back because that's what our method returns. And if we specify an item, let's say number five, then we get employees five. And that extension could be anything you like really. So I could put in say employees A. We can use this as an identifier such as a UID or a numeric identifier for a record in that set. Okay, 
So with that done, let's go ahead and, oh, okay, so this message that's popped up, this is a message coming from the Indie components that you'll get from time to time. It's not really a uh, message to be concerned about. This is a this is an exception that's being handled by the Indie framework, but the IDE is trapping it anyway. Now you could just set ignore this exception and never see it again. I'm just gonna go ahead and break out and end my program. Okay, so let's go and take a look at the server that I've built. Okay, so in the RAD server C package, which is the C++ builder version of the source code here, if I go and take a look at module main, you can see that on the module itself, I have a connection and a query component. This is just a FireDAC connection and a FireDAC query. And they are bound to the interface database that ships the employee database here that ships with RAD Studio. So I've just gone in here in the data explorer and dragged the employee table onto my module. And then I've renamed the components to con for connection and qry for query. If we go and take a look at the code here, the, these are the exact same methods as we've just been looking at. The get method, get item, post, put item, and delete item. So let's take a look at each of these methods real quick. The get method, what I'm doing here is simply activating that query, which is bound to the employee table. And then I am checking that I have records come back and building a new JSON array. Within that JSON array, I'm gonna first go to the first record of the database, loop through each of those records. And for each one, I'm creating a new object to insert into the array. And then I'm adding each field from the database as a pair, name value pair, to that object. At the end of the loop here, I'm adding the object to the array. And then when we step outside the loop, I'm setting the body of our response class to the value A, so setting it to the JSON array. And again, the property true says that the response owns that array. So when we run this project, if we call the HTTP get method, we'll just get all records from the database. If we specify an item on the URL, then things are gonna be slightly different. What I'm gonna do here is modify the SQL for the, uh, the query. And I'm gonna say, I wanna select everything from the employee table, but only where the employee number matches item, which is a parameter. So I'm gonna set that parameter to the value of item, which I obtained from the request. So that's gonna get the item from the URL. I'm setting the query active. I'm not looping through the records this time. I'm going to the first record, creating a JSON object, adding all of the fields, and then simply adding that one object to the body. So I'm not gonna return multiple items. We've requested specifically one. Uh, so I'll just return the one that's been requested. The post method, well here we're doing things a little differently. We are decoding from the body of the request a JSON object. And that's because what we're gonna do with the post method, remember this maps to the create method of CRUD, is we're creating a new entry for the database. And we're gonna send that up as a JSON object. So it's gonna have name value pairs for first name, last name, phone number, and so on. So I'm decoding that from the request body and storing it as the request object. Then I'm modifying my SQL here. So I'm gonna clear it out and create an insert statement. These are the fields I care about, and then a parameter for each of those fields. I'm then gonna set each of those parameters as values obtained from that request object. So that request object will have a first name and a last name. I'm gonna grab those values out and set my parameters. Then I'm gonna go ahead and execute that query, and then I'm gonna do something a little bit uh, unusual here. Because I'm working with Interbase, uh, every database is gonna do this slightly differently. Uh, I need to call the generator in the database and ask it what was the new employee record number. So the new record that was just created has a primary key, there's a constraint with a generator on it or a trigger with a generator, uh, and I want to know what number record that was. I'm gonna take that number and put it into a JSON object and return it to the client. So the client now will have a number that they can use to go look up that record. Okay, let's take a look at the put item method. Now remember, HTTP put maps to update. So what we're gonna do here is update an employee record. So to do that, from the request again on the URL, we have an item. And I'm gonna get that back and convert it to an integer so I have the employee number. 
and so the uh, the item on our URL is our employee number then it's going to have an object the same as the create method did this object will be the new representation for this employee record so it's basically the same as a create but we know that the record already exists which is going to mask the new values on top of the existing record so I'm creating an update statement parameterizing the fields again setting those parameters from that request object which I just decoded executing the query and then just as a confirmation sending back the employee number as part of a JSON object and finally the delete method well here we're getting the item number again and storing that as the employee number we're creating a custom query which will delete from our employee table parameterizing the employee number and passing that in so that's our item from the URL passed in as the employee number execute the query and return the employee number as a confirmation so let's go ahead and start this server running and because I know that this code works I'm going to start this without the debugger so that we can uh, just run code against it so there's my server running and if I open up the browser and I go to my employees resource there we go we have all of the employee records coming back okay so let's open up the rest debugger and take a look at this tools rest debugger the first thing I'm going to do is put in the URL of my server so that would be localhost on port 8080 and then on the parameters tab I want to tell it which resource I'm interested in well that's employees okay so I'm going to go ahead and send that request and in the body here I get back my employee records and there should be quite a few of them if I go ahead and scroll right down to the bottom we can see that the last employee here is 145 mark Guckenheimer okay so that's our last employee let's suppose now that we want to create a new employee so I'm going to go ahead and select the post method which maps to create now I'm going to be sending up a body here a custom body so I need to tell it what the content of that body is that's going to be application JSON I'm going to stretch that body parameter out a little so that you can see the data the reason that I'm doing this is the database that I'm using does have some constraints against it and so if you're trying to replicate what I'm doing here using my source code you'll want to use the same values at least initially to confirm that it's working for example there are a limited number of departments and if you put the wrong department number in you will get an exception when it can't create the record I'm going to go ahead and create a record here for myself Craig Chapman and I am the vice president and earning over 105,000 a year that would be nice let's go ahead and send that request and I've been created as employee number 157 so if I change back now to the get method and I do a uh, send request then scroll all the way to the bottom of the records we can see Craig Chapman employee 14, uh, 157 so let's go ahead and request 157 specifically I'm going to just add it to the end of my URL here and if I send the request you can see that I get just that one record back okay fantastic so now that I have that one record what if I want to change it well let's go ahead and do a put method and again I'm sending up this custom body this is going to be the new representation for the Craig Chapman record let's say that I got married and decided to take my wife's name and so we're, we're going to change my name here to Joe Lee okay great let's send that request in but we need to make sure that 157 is still on our resource parameter because I'm specifically editing that one record go ahead and send and it sends me back 157 as a confirmation so again if I call get with that same parameter I get the record back and I now create Jolie which is fantastic finally let's go ahead and do a delete so I'll select the delete method here and I still want this parameter send request and I'm now gone so if I attempt to uh, get record 157 nothing comes back if I get all records you'll see here that all of the records come back but sadly Craig Jolie is no longer in there so that is all four methods of our server demonstrated working let's go and take a look at the client code for this now bear in mind I still have the server running in the background so I'm going to go and open up employee client C that's the C++ builder client project and we'll take a look at the form. 
So I have three components at the bottom of my form here, a REST request, a REST response, and a REST client. The client is effectively the HTTP client, and I'm pointing it at loopback port 8080. So that's pointing at my service. The request here, let's see, this is bound to the same client. The resource here, or rather the resource here, is employees. Uh, and then the response is bound to this response component, which is going to receive data whenever the request is executed. If we take a look at the response, you can see that content says empty, but I can execute this request right now in the designer. I get a 200 OK. If I look at my response, I've got 8,000 bytes of data and there are the employee records. So now that I have these three components, I can use them to perform uh, all four of our CRUD methods. So I've got some buttons on the form here. Read is going to read all records from the database. It's not going to specify an item, it'll just read everything. Um, next and previous, these buttons are going to allow me to navigate forwards and backwards through those records. First and last will take me to the first record or the last record respectively. The create button actually isn't going to do anything with regards to the rest calls. What the create button will do is it will put all of the uh, edits on the form into a uh, edit editable mode, so it'll be non-read only. Uh, and then when you click on commit, those changes that you make to those fields will be submitted back to the database. Uh, so that's going to happen by uh, calling the create rest, rest method on the commit button. Uh, the edit button is the same. It's going to go into an editable mode, but it's going to allow you to edit the record that you're currently looking at. And when you click on update, that's when the actual edit will happen. That's when the uh, HTTP put will be called. Uh, so that'll allow us to update. And then there's the delete method, which will allow us to delete an individual record. So let's go and take a look at the code behind these, starting with the read button. So the read button is modifying the rest request on the form, making sure that it's pointing at the employee's resource. It's setting the HTTP method here to get, so that's our read method, and just making sure that the rest response is correctly bound, and then it's executing that request. Once that request is executed, it's going to send back all of the records in the database as a big JSON array. So we're going to store that JSON array as a, a member of the class, and then we'll set an, a current index to zero and call JSON to form. Now JSON to form is just going to go read that array that we just received and copy the values into the edits on the form. I could have done this using live bindings, but this is from some older code that I decided to copy across uh, where I'd done it manually. So this is just going to copy our results onto the form for us. Let's take a look at the create uh, button here. So this is just going to clear the form and enter create mode. So that's just going to set all of the edits as editable. And it'll also enable the commit button. So when we hit commit, again, we're going to make sure we're on the employees resource. We're this time going to select the post HTTP method because this is committing a new record. So that's a create. Uh, again, we're setting the response to make sure it's bound, and then we're using uh, this JSON writer, which is part of the request body, to write in as name value pairs the fields we care about. So property name, first name, property value is uh, edit first name dot text, and so on. So it's basically going to push those field values in for us. Then we're going to edit enter browse mode. I suppose that could have been done after the execute. Uh, which is just going to put us back into a read-only mode. We're going to execute this request to send the new record up, and then we're going to call the read button again to read all of the records back out of the database. Okay, so the edit button here uh, is going to do very much the same thing as create did. It's just entering edit mode, so it makes the boxes editable. And then the update button, well, this is where we're now going to select the put method to update a record. And because we're updating a single record that we want to specify, I'm adding here the uh, employee number to the resource. So we're specifically stating this is the resource, this is the record I wish to edit. And then we're doing much the same thing. We're passing the parameters up as name value pairs, entering back into browse mode, execute the request, and hit the read button again. So let's go and take a look at the delete method. And what we're doing here is we are adding the specific employee number to the end of the URL. We are setting the method to the HTTP 
delete method, we're executing the request and then we're hitting that read button again. So let's go ahead and see this uh, application run. Okay, so if I go ahead and press the read button, we can see that we've got Robert Nelson come back. I can press next to go to the next record, next, 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 previous. I can skip all the way back to the first record, Robert Nelson, or I can skip to the last record, Mark Guckenheimer. Okay, so we can now navigate our data. Let's take a look at creating a new record. I'm going to create a new record for Craig Chapman uh, extension 250, department number 600, job code, I'll be the vice president, job grade 2 in the USA, 105,900. So I'm going to go ahead and commit that record, and that has now been added to the database, but our form is reset to the first record because it hit read again. So I'm going to hit last, and that should take me to my new record. Yes, there it is, Craig Chapman. So there's the new record that I've inserted. Let's go ahead now and make an edit to this record. I'm going to change Craig Chapman to Craig Jolie again. And when I hit update, I'm automatically taken back to the first record. Let's go to the last. It's been updated to Craig Jolie. And finally, let's hit the delete button to do away with this record. And if I hit last, there we are at the end of the database and the Craig record is gone. So that's how to build REST services and REST clients using RAD Server and RAD Studio. All of the source code for the projects in the video today will be linked in the video description or in the blog post which accompanies this video. My name is Craig Chapman and thanks for watching.